Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Clues Views. Today, I've got a guest for you, uh, Timothy Flanders, who will be giving a presentation about... Um, it's a presentation that he gave. I'll let him talk more about that, but it's connected to a book that he published, um, which I have right here as well, called City of God versus City of Man. So, um, yeah, it's good to have you on. And hey, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, it's good to have you on here. I um, always enjoy talking to you. Um, so do you want to go ahead and we'll start with a prayer and then yeah, man. let people know what we'll be talking about. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we'll be talking about Joseph Ratzinger in the Fourth Greco-Roman Renewal. So... Before you start, you want to just let my audience know a little bit more about yourself, just in case they're yeah, listening. yeah, sure. So I am a Catholic writer. Um, I have a degree in Greek and Latin. I was doing a grad program in ecumenical studies at the Catholic University of Ukraine, but I never finished that because I got engaged. Uh, I had to quit that, and um, but I got back in the Catholic writing world in the past few years, and. Um, finishing th this book is actually, uh, this was going to be my dissertation, um, for my PhD, but I never got around to doing my PhD. So, uh, this is the, basically it's, it's an attempt to synthesize, uh, Augustine city of God against the pagans, his, his greatest work with the work of one of his greatest disciples of history, uh, namely Christopher Dawson. And as we'll talk about today, Ratzinger is also very much a disciple of Augustine and Augustinian historical theology. So it's a it's a spiritual history of culture, which attempts to take this sort of Dawsonian meta historical perspective of church history. So um, that's that is uh, what I do. I, I founded an apostolate at uh, called the Meaning of Catholic, which is a collaborative lay apostolate on the internet. And I'm also the re the editor of One Peter Five, so that is what I do. Wonderful, yeah. So regarding the theme, do you want to go ahead and give your presentation and then sure, go from there? yeah. So th this is going to be um, uh, one of the themes, one of the linear themes of this meta historical uh, attempt at the synthesis in this book um, is a theory about the the theology of doctrinal development as a historical reality. And so it's a reflection on the cultural aspects which God placed providentially within Christendom in the way that he built the church. And he built the church, obviously, on the typological foundation of Israel, being the, this uh, typological foundation of, uh, obviously, the Old Testament. But he takes that as sort of the soul, and he put play, he sort of breathes that soul into this thing called Greco-Roman civilization, which is already being built parallel to uh, the Hebrews' uh, revelation, as we as we note. It is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Noah, where he says that uh, Shem and Japheth will dwell in the same tent. So there's uh, this melding of the uh, the Hebrew, the Greco-Roman which is also prophesied on the uh, the sign of our Lord's crucifixion on the three languages. So these three languages are the critical cultural pieces of Christendom. And what we see here is that as the early church begins, we can identify these different sort of periods of what, what I call in the book Greco-Roman renewal. And the Greco-Roman renewal is when the church is defining its relationship to the tradition given to it by its founder, Jesus Christ, vis-a-vis -vis or by means of Greco-Roman civilization. And there is sort of there's this tension in the early church that's going on uh, the during the anti-Nicene period. And this is basically uh, this tension that you can see between these different catechetical schools that are developing, Antiochian, Alexandrian, you have the Roman under the various Latin writers sort of developing. We also have the Syriac 
uh, which are not, this is something that appears in my book, um, but is not very mentioned, very covered in a lot of histories. Um, but it becomes acute, obviously, during the Aryan crisis. The Aryan crisis is something that was, it's kind of the first universal heresy that really grips the church. And it necessitates this, the utilizing of this Roman institution that's ultimately known as the, the ecumenical council by means of the Roman emperor and utilizing Greek terminology. And the, this, the first period of Greco-Roman renewal is this, what manifests these different instincts of Christendom. We talk about in the book um, that as Hebrew culture melds with Greco-Roman civilization, you see this sort of Greek, the Greek instinct of Christendom, and you see this Roman instinct of Christendom. And there's this, this is fantastic quote that Christopher Dawson found, which he put in, um, I think it's in Dividing of Christendom, it's in the book, but he has this hilarious quote where Ephraim the Syrian, so Ephraim, he's, he's, his first language is Syriac, so he's not actually even a Greek, he's not even Hellenized, even though he, he's right close to that. He makes this observation about the Greeks and how the Greeks are just constantly fighting over all these different nuances of theology and different points of controversy. And uh, St. Ephraim the Syrian is just kind of like, why are you guys making this? You know, you're debating so bitterly. And this really harkens to this Greek instinct, this Greek instinct, which is mentioned in the book of Acts as uh, when St. Paul goes to the Athenians. The uh, St. Luke says in Acts that all the Athenians, all they did was they got together and discussed some new thing. And that was sort of this Greek thing that, you know, and, and this is also has to do with Greek language, the, the subtleties of the Greek language, which allow for the subtleties of philosophy. And so there's this Greek instinct for some new thing. So it's sort of this instinct for newness, this desire to know more, this desire to penetrate the reality of truth. Now, that gets balanced by this Roman instinct. And then the Roman instinct is this instinct for this order, this changelessness, this uh, juridical stability. And this is something that created the, the Greco-Roman civilization in the first place before the, any of this happened. Um, but we can see this in the theology that develops and the theological instinct. You know, there's no, there's no Western heresy other than Pelagianism, which we could even tie to a Roman instinct. Um, there's Tertullian actually goes after a sort of a, a stricter thing in Montanism. Um, whereas the Greeks just invent all these heresies. And part of it is because of this Greek instinct of some new thing. But because of this tension, this balance between the Roman and the Greek, this balance between the, the Roman instinct is the ever ancient faith and the Greek is the instinct of the ever new faith. Just like St. Augustine says, Late have I loved the beauty ever ancient, ever new. So there's this Greek instinct and this Roman instinct. And in the, the first, this first renewal, this, this, which is the period of the seven ecumenical councils, uh, we see that the church really utilizes both and. They have to have this Greek instinct because they, they have to innovate. They have to, to fight Arianism. They have to create a new word, a new terminology, consustantial and patri, homoousios. They have to use this Greek word to really get at the metaphysical reality of what's going on. And the Greek languages and the Greek culture is what allows them to do that. But because of the Roman instinct, that helps them to do this in, in a more or less orderly fashion, even though we know there's tons of, tons of chaos over the first you know, few hundred years. So there's this, this basic, this Roman and Greek instinct, and that's the period of this first Greco-Roman renewal which really establishes the, the fundamental dogmas of our faith. And we see that God's providence brings the church through this period, this very tumultuous period, bloody, bloodshed everywhere. Um, nevertheless, through this, the, these difficulties and, and this, this tension between the Greco and the Roman instinct, imbued with the Hebrew spirit, the Holy Spirit, um, the our, our forefathers hammer out the basic doctrines of the faith. So this is this first period. Now there are I, I'm saying that there are these four different periods, and we're in we're in the fourth period right now. And Joseph Brasker has this critical role to play. Um, but do you have any comments so far, Richard, on on this uh, thought so far? Yeah, I mean, I just I like the idea of the providential character of it because 
and I think this is something Ratzinger agrees with, is that, you know, when you have the, the largely Protestant critique of Catholicism as being overly Hellenized, so it's like taking biblical faith and overly making it Greek, um, that Ratzinger would tend to see it more as like, no, there, there's providence involved here. Like these things unfolded when they did precisely because there's a confluence of aspects of these cultures that was conducive to the promulgation of Revelation. I mean, even before the New Testament period, you had, you already had this conversation between the Hebrew and the Greek minds. And then, of course, when Jesus, by his day, you had all three. You had the Greek, the Roman, and the Hebrew together. And I think that's important because our, our faith is does reflect all of those. And in some sense, that makes it more universal, but also helps overcome the weaknesses of each of the, the benefits of the others. Like you can have long advocated for the idea that in theology studies, there should be courses on the Jewish roots of Christianity. And we see a lot of that coming out in recent biblical scholarship by like um, Brant Petrie and Michael Barber and stuff like that. And Scott Hahn, where you're, you're seeing the wisdom of how the old Testament really does shed light on the new. Um, but then, you know, metaphysics as Ratzinger argue is art will argue is absolutely critical. You can't get rid of it. And it's, Metaphysical realism is rooted in ancient Greek philosophy. So you really can't, you can't get away from it. You can't just throw it out. If you throw it out, Ratzinger will argue both philosophy and theology will be impoverished. And I, yeah. I do think today a lot of our crisis in our culture is a loss of metaphysics. Absolutely. I, I was just reading... Um... Cardinal Mueller's, um, his piece on Ratzinger in First Things, Ratzinger and the Liberation Theology theologians, and he was saying that he he would boil down Ratzinger's legacy legacy as defending the synthesis of faith and reason, uh, and obviously the the Regensburg Address comes to mind mm -hmm. as a, a provost to what you just said because he does say that there is this confluence in providence between the Greek Revelation and the Hebrew. Um, that he says was already going on. He says that it's evidence in the wind, wisdom literature, the deuterocanonical books. Um, and yeah, I definitely, I mean, uh, there's the Septuagint written in Greek and there's these, the deuterocanonicals, which see, may may have been original language Greek, some of them. Um, <clears throat> and um, obviously St. John says, in the beginning was the Logos. And the Logos is an entirely metaphysical Greek uh, pedigree. It already has this whole Greek um metaphysical school behind that uh which is just being plucked out by saint john and used to describe something that's uh, it's ineffable in, in just a, a pure hebrew tongue or a hebrew metaphysics that doesn't really have that language that vocabulary um so um basically there's sort of the same thing that goes on i argue in the book um in the second greco roman uh, renewal and the third it's basically the church resourcing parts of Greek, Greco, and Roman civilization and using it for the service of the faith. And so in the second Greco-Roman renewal, we have um, we have St. Thomas resourcing and baptizing again Aristotle and utilizing Aristotle in a new way, and which was controversial, just like the utilization of Greek greek uh you know greek philosophy was at the council of nicaea using this greek term it was controversial in saint thomas's day and he you know saint thomas was actually kind of the progressive of his day people don't realize that um he really was I mean, <laughs> so it uh, was very much under suspicion because basically platonism neoplatonism was the philosophy of the church for you know right. by 1200 years <laughs> so yeah um yeah, yeah there's the I believe it's 1277, right um, after his death, when yeah. there's a bunch of Aristotelian principles condemned. Right, three um, like three years after he died, I think something like that. Yeah. yeah. So Saint Thomas is this sort of progressive of his day. He's he's taking this 
new Aristotle that's he's getting from the Muslims who got it from the Syriac Christians or other sources as well. He's he's dialoguing with the Jews too. He's got he's quoting Maimonides, seeing what Maimonides had to say. Um, but what what we see here is that he's he's resourcing something that was lost. He's taking something and and using it for something new for the same old faith. So he's not trying to change the faith. He's trying to just utilize it in a new way for the sake of defending the faith. And his big opponent, obviously, is St. Bonaventure, who is the uh, what uh, Ratzinger does his uh, his doctoral work on. And uh, Bonaventure critiques Aristotle, and he continues the Augustinian legacy of the Neoplatonism. But it's because of this, uh, there is this renewal. There's this new synthesis because... Uh, with this back and forth between these different schools of thought, Bonnet between Bonaventure and Thomas and others, um, there is this resourcing and what we call the high middle ages, this great uh, civilization flourishing and the philosophy flourishing. We have the really the creation of the modern scientific method is in this period because they're utilizing Greek philosophy, new Greek yep. philosophy, St. Albert the Great. You know, he's he's utilizing Aristotle, who Aristotle is much better on scientific stuff. You know, he's a lot better on that sort of thing than Plato is. Um, so he helps to create the new scientific method. I mean, this is so much of uh, so much greatness comes out of this period. And it's because of this, again, Greco-Roman renewal, because and here's the key is if the Greeks, the Greeks go too far towards some new thing. You become an Averroist. You become, or or you you fall into some you know immense uh, new thing, and you change the faith. You become a modernist, basically, in some way. You become a heretic, and then if you are too strict on the other side, and you're so you're so resistant to anything new, um, then you can't just like in Nicaea, you can't combat Arianism without utilizing this new term, which correctly clarifies what's really being said. Um, so there needs to be both and there needs to be both both of these instincts need to balance each other. And I argue in the book that there is this that's how the synthesis comes about is that there is this true what I call the dialogos, which is the Greek term for dialogue. But dialogue is, is uh, been very misunderstood in our own day. Yes. But dialogos in terms of Socrates, Socrates dialogos means two parties or more debating and digesting the truth and trying to hammer it out. That's that's the whole point of a dialogos. Um, and what I argue is that there there is this sort of dialogos between the Greek instinct and the Roman instinct. So you see that in the second period, too. And you also see it in the third. Third's the, the again, the same thing, because now they're resourcing the Greek tongue. They've got Erasmus is coming out with the new Greek, Greek Testament. They've got the new humanism who wants to use all these linguistic things that they they have. That's all new. They want to use all this new stuff again new stuff like Erasmus wants to use the new stuff for the same faith, but some of them go too far and become Luther and the Protestants. Whereas on the other hand, there are the, the scholastics, uh, the Cajetans of the day who want to maintain the inheritance from the high middle ages. So they want to maintain it. But I think what, what you see between the council of Florence and Lateran five and Trent, you see a very tumultuous, again, very tumultuous, which foreshadows our current period. Um, but it's tumultuous, but you see that God's providence really brings through the church through this tumultuous period and God gives birth to the Baroque civilization, the, what I call in the book, second Christendom, um, that continues on and grows in places like Italy, Austria, Spain, uh, the Americas. Um, and it's a, it's a melding of these two things. Again, we have the humanism, the Renaissance humanism on the one hand, which is that Greek instinct for something new. And then we have the Roman instinct of maintaining the same faith. And I think you see it great. You see it greatly in Trent because Trent departs from scholastic language of old. So it's actually utilizing something new and just refutes all the Protestants using scripture, basically. And like basically kind of meets them at their own level and sort of utilizes the humanism, uh, but with the same faith. And so there is, again, the same dialogos between these two parties. So any thoughts before we get to our modernity, Richard? Yeah, I just think it's it's very helpful. I like the way that you're showing the parallels between the high scholastic period and our, our own time because people don't often realize this. Like they'll 
they'll too quickly call people modernists who aren't modernists and who are actually against the moderns. Yeah. Um, just because they engage with modern philosophy because they're trying to answer its questions and they're reading it and they're citing it and they're responding to it. That's exactly what Aquinas did. I mean, if you think about it, he took this ancient pagan philosopher whose writings had pretty much been lost that were resurfacing in large part to the work of Muslim scholars who were bringing it to the world. And he's engaging with the Muslim philosophers, Avicenna, um, um, Averroes. Averroes, yeah. And he's engaging with their thought, you know, and that's exactly what he's doing. He's responding to it. But he's he's not just accepting it wholesale, but he's taking what's useful and he's rejecting what's bad. Um, and, you know, that's sort of like what the church has always done. You know, it's baptize what you can and purify what is superfluous. So, you know, it's I, I see this often just even in even in orthodox theological circles, low O, lowercase O. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as you, you use the word history or historical, you're accused of being Hegelian. As soon as you refer to the person, you're all of a sudden, you know, a a relativist or, you know, subjective philosophy. It's like, look, even Aquinas dealt with the human subject and how a human person knows. And the note is known according to the mode of the knower. Like talking about how humans know is not reducing everything to, a, you know, a subjectivist perspective, you know, and not everything that's historical is Hegelian. Like, I mean, right. His fathers are imbued with a sense of history and a theology of history, which is what Ratzinger's approved Habilitation Schrift, his second dissertation, was about. St. Bonaventure's understanding of our theology of history. So, you know, sometimes we, we hear these buzzwords and then the danger is we allow the people who, who use those terms inappropriately to dominate those terms. And it's like, no, there's orthodox ways of using these things and of approaching them. And, yeah, absolutely. And like you said, it's that balance. It's you have the Greek mind, then the Roman discipline, the juridical mind, the legal mind is part of that, the whole Roman understanding of the tradition and also the legal structure, like how you keep things in order. And yeah. finding that balance is, can be difficult because in any period, things can go to one side or the other. And I've got more I could say about Ratzinger and all that stuff, but that's we'll leave that for the later <laughs> yeah oh well let, well let's get let's get into that i mean um so so what what i what i term in the book the fourth greco-roman renewal i date in the period of revolution is but especially when the um patrologia latina begins to be published and the Graeca and the orientalis so these are dozens of dozens of new critical editions of the Latin, Greek, and also other fathers like the Syriac, like I said, um, who are republished for the first time in critical editions. So, um, and there's new technology because everybody's finding all these old manuscripts for the first time. And they've got all this, the new studies of manuscript textual critical editions. So, if viewers are not familiar with this, this what, how that how this works, <clears throat> Saint Thomas Aquinas wrote this. It's it's very it's kind of this weird providential thing, where Saint Thomas Aquinas was was on his way to the Council of Lyon too, and and he had in his hand this work called Contra Errores Graecorum against the errors of the Greeks, and in this work he had about 50% of the patristic citations were actually spurious. They weren't actually real citations. They were forgeries or attributed to the wrong person or some kind of bad text, basically. And as Providence would have it, he, he died on the way to that council. And we can just kind of predict that what would have happened if he would have presented this document to the Greeks and they would have been like, what are you talking about? You know, what are all these texts? You've ne we've never seen those texts before. And that was actually a big debate over at the Council of Florence, but that's another story. But the point is, St. Thomas Aquinas himself did not have access to the amount of manuscripts and texts that were with the church was now given access to in the 19th century. It was just a wealth of information that we 
never really had. Uh, and and that also goes for the Holy Scriptures, because there's all these archaeological studies and all this new historical knowledge that we we can gain and understand the deep, all sorts of deeper insights and, and things within the Holy Scriptures that we never really knew or were forgotten, basically. Um, <clears throat> so we have this unprecedented, totally unprecedented. I mean, it's kind of like the Renaissance a little bit, like the little, Renaissance has like a little bit of that, you know, resourcing Greek, but it's just kind of, it's like this floodgate in the 19th century where there's all this new stuff. Um, and it's at a time when the church is actually facing massive bloodshed from the liberal revolutionaries and the communists and, and people just killing each other and starting more wars. And eventually we have World War One and Two. So it's a very tumultuous period. Um, and there's a lot of different historical factors that go into things that affect the way that theology is done in the history of Christendom. Uh, things like the suppression of the Jesuits in 1773 and the secularizing states take over so many libraries across the world, which were run by Jesuits. Mm -hmm. um, so the church is robbed of so many of her resources to be able to even teach the theologians. Um, there's industrialization. So everyone's fleeing the rural Christendom that they used to have, like Rutsker had in Bavaria, this, this, this uh, strong integrated Christendom in the, in the hills that uh, Romano Guardini talks about in one of his writings in Italy. Um, and they're losing all that. They're, they're getting packed in the cities. Um, and, and then there's a huge population boom as well. I mean, there's like tons more people out there too. And um, Henry Chadwick in his book, um, the uh, secularization of the European mind in the 19th century. He talks about how the church couldn't even, he couldn't even build enough churches fast enough to cover all the people who were either being born or coming to the cities. It was just a revolutionary period. And the church finds herself in this, in this sort of trying to catch up and face the situation that's going on while, while being attacked, you know, we're, we're the, the first Vatican Council was stopped because uh, because the Italian revolutionaries took over Rome. You know, so it's like they're like doing an ecumenical council during a war on Rome. So it's this intense period uh, of, in the 19th century of the, this fourth Greco Roman renewal. And in response, the church the church fights against the this all this liberal revolution. Uh, with a very strict and severe hand. And this is the church leaning on its Roman instinct of keeping things as they are. And it makes sense why the church did this, because, you know, when, when you have an army attacking your church, you're, you don't have time to have a philosophical discourse. You know, you just got to fight. You got to take your rosaries, take your sword, you know, get, get to it. And that's kind of the church, church's approach up until Vatican II, but I think there's there's certain things that happen during this period which create a situation which providentially results in Vatican II. So it's it's first this the church leaning on its Roman instinct, condemning so many evils that are going on and so many new things that are just really new heresies, all the different errors of liberalism and communism. Um, but and, and, and uh, we have Vatican I and we have um, Leo the Thirteenth, Eterni Patris, who is falling back on Thomism uh, to reestablish the basics of Catholic theology that has been decimated, as I said, for 100 years at that point with all these just lack of resources in, in this revolutionary period. Um, and there is a falling back on the, this, the, this basics of the faith to fight against all these new things. Um, but there is this tension in the church, which especially becomes acute during the modernist crisis, because the modernists like Alfred Wazi and George Tyrrell want to take this new this new stuff that's good, this good stuff like the archaeology, archaeology and, and patristics and stuff, and they want to use it, but they want to actually change the faith. They want to actually argue that there's an evolution of dogma, you know, that there's religion is really just this sentiment and all this nonsense. Um, so they want to use the new things to change the faith and they're rightly condemned. But the, the, the problem is that what results from this very strict and severe fight against modernism is that the church is in a, a very, very strongly Roman instinct to the exclusion of the Greek instinct. 
So there's a certain defense against anything new, which becomes imbalanced in some areas. Now, I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that there was just so many more people doing theology at this time with a lot fewer resources. Um, and people were relying to a great degree on manuals and manuals are just like a basic textbook. And, you know, if somebody's, you know, there was at, at this time um, in the, in the early 20th century, you have world war one and world war two, which destroys more of the church, more of the resources and more of the churches and everything like that. Um, so we have this situation where people are trying to do theology in a difficult period where the church is very resistant to anything new. And there are there is a great renewal of a, a, a good scholasticism in some areas, like Gary Goulagrange. He's the shining example of good scholasticism, good Thomism, doing true theology. Um, but unfortunately, there are a lot of basically these fast food Thomists who get a PhD over the weekend, or not the weekend, over the yeah, summer, yeah. but literally over the summer. Yeah. They do get a PhD over the summer. And then they read the manual to the students who are yawning. You know, they, they're just like, this is, you know, they're they're not really acting like true Thomas. You know, they're not really good Thomas. They're just kind of like in this situation. Um, but there is this resistance to anything new and utilizing this new stuff to the degree among some where it's, it's sort of this environment of no salvation outside Thomism. It's a Roman instinct to keep, to keep things the same to the exclusion of the Greek instinct to use anything new. And so this is where there is actually a, um, so th this comes out of Pius X um, and the way that this is implemented outside Italy, the fight against modernism. But basically it's a situation where it becomes acute in the 1940s, where you have this French patristic renewal that's been going on since Ming. We mentioned the Petrologia Graeca and Latina. That was uh, that was French scholarship. The French were, were were editing these texts. And in the in the 20th century, they were publishing more of these patristic texts. And um, there was this dispute between the these these thinkers in France um, with the Roman theologians, because Gary Lagrange saw some of them who were trying to do the same thing that the modernists were, arguably. We can debate about that if you like. But um, And then there was others who, we, as we'll say, like Ratzinger, who were actually trying to use the new things to try to do something good. Now, so, something that um, I heard Jared Goff mention, Jared Goff is a Franciscan Bonaventurian scholar. He mentioned how the church really relied on Thomism to such a high extent in an unprecedented way. One of the reasons was because Bonaventure didn't even have a critical edition. Like they just had these, right. they didn't have those texts Let's available at the time. Scotus. So Ratziger, oh yeah, you want to add something? Go ahead. No, I say Scotus as well. They didn't yeah, Scotus, have right. Editions of Scotus. And, um, and it really, in many ways, the, the divide was between the French and the French because you had the French, the Roman like Gergou Lagrange taught in Rome, but he was French. Right, right. It was the French Dominicans against the French Jesuits in large part, and some French Dominicans. So you had some French Dominicans against other French Dominicans and against the Jesuits. So, yeah, yeah. there's a, John Kerwin's book, Avant-Garde Theological Generation, I think is, a, I mean, what happens in France is kind of like a microcosm of the whole church because Action Francaise gets condemned in 1927 because they were a little bit too secular, but they still had a lot of good people trying to fight for um, like a, the monarchy and, and Christendom and stuff like that. And so what ends up happening after 1927 is that there is this um, marginalization of that wing of French Catholicism. Um, and that the, there's the Roman, the French seminary in Rome. I don't know if it's the, it's the one Lefebvre went to. I, can't, I don't know if it, what it's called exactly, but yeah, like you're saying, there's these French, French in Rome and then the Gary Goulourange is French. And then there's some French Jesuits in France, but there's this very bitter divide in French culture, in French Christendom. Yeah. I mean, part of it has to do with World War II as well. Um, lots of different factors. But um, essentially, there is this sort of no salvation outside Thomism attitude in some quarters, not everywhere. But um, this is what causes some animosity to grow, like 
we've talked about Henri de Lubach uh, was basically can, he was like shut out. I, I mean, you know more, more about this than I do, but he was, uh, he was he basically, basically persecuted. He was basically, he was punished by his superiors, but with no actual trial or even explanation of what he had done wrong. Right. I mean, he specifically asked like, well, what is it that I've said that is problematic? And they wouldn't tell. Him. Right. So it, it was, if you read his book at the service of the church, I mean, he's got in the appendix, he's got um, like letters and documents and stuff like exchange where he goes through exchanges with his superiors and things. And um, it's, I actually wrote an article for that. Uh, about right. That. But it's, um, yeah, yeah, so I mean, he was never condemned uh, by the Pope or the Holy Office. He was never really even directly investigated. Him, it was him and some other French Jesuits that were sort of suppressed by their own order, but without really a due process. Yeah. Now you broke up a little bit when you just said that. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Am I coming through okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I think. Yeah, I can hear you. It's a little garbled. Here, let me let me try to go out and come back in real quick. Hold on a second. It might be mine. I can hear you just fine, so it's probably my microphone. Let's see, hopefully we can get this fixed. But yeah, just to, I'll just talk a little bit until he pops back on. Um, basically, you have different factions within the French Jesuits even that were doing different projects and de Lubac was trying to recover what he saw as the authentic Thomistic tradition um, in, in contradiction to some of the later commentators like Cajetan and, um, the Jesuit Suarez, and that got him into some, um, issues, um, so with them, but then there, there were some things that certain French Jesuits were saying that were questionable and problematic and the French Dominicans were calling him out for it. Um, and it gets complicated, but, um, you just, you have concerns over different aspects of things being said. So it looks like, so according to the chat, they can hear us fine. So it might just be us not being able to hear, or you not being able to hear me very well. So, I think he's sending me a message. Hold on. <clears throat> Yeah, so, yeah, he just sent me a, <laughs> uh, a message with the link, but it must be something on his end where he's not hearing me. So, anyway, um, Jacob, um, you haven't, you've missed kind of like the precursor to everything, a 40-minute precursor. Um, we haven't gotten into the Ratzinger stuff too much yet, but he's been setting the stage talking about, um, oh, let me add him back in. All yeah, right. I, I'm going to, my, 
uh, we had a storm here, so maybe my internet is. I, I just went on my phone, so can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. The according to the chat, they they could hear us all fine. Oh, that's good. I, I, so, I think it was just on my end then, just uh, yeah. not coming through. But um, but yeah. Let, or did you have a question, or do you want to talk about Rask or get into that? Yeah, we can just go ahead and get into that. Yeah, we haven't really gotten into Rasiger yet, but well, basically, like what's what's so great about Rasiger is that he adopts a rival school of thought to the dominant neo Thomism, and this is restoring. This is something that Christopher Dawson says so acutely in the year 1960, which is something. So I think this is something that trads need to see. They need to see the environment that was going on. Yes, there were these great people like Gary Lebrange. There were great Thomas going on. There was great things going on pre-Vatican II. But there were also these issues where in certain areas, there was this no salvation outside Thomism situ like environment or attitude or witch hunt, what have you. And Christopher Dawson says this so well in 1960. So this is right before Vatican II. And he says that the um, basically there is this analogy to Marxism where people are being sort of forced into this sort of ideological structure and there's no the, there's the loss of the rival schools of Christendom, as there was in in these various other renewal periods that we're talking about. There's this dialogos between these various instincts, as well as different schools of thought like Thomism and Bonaventurianism, Scotism, et cetera, Suarism. And, and we didn't even talk about the Greek fathers. So, I mean, especially I want I want to emphasize here is that to the Eastern Catholic, the Eastern Catholic, the Eastern Catholic bishops of Vatican I were protesting the excessive sort of this Roman instinct that was a little bit too excessive to the exclusion of Greek concerns. And this is something that uh, John O'Malley in his book, What Happened in Vatican II, he actually references one of the, um, all of the, there was all these different um, uh, desiderata of the bishops that were sent to Vatican II. And one of the, one of the Eastern Catholics were, was saying, uh, there is an issue because the Latin theologians invest everything into the Roman pontiff as if he is the whole church. And, and basically um, what I'm saying is the Eastern Catholic perspective of this period is a similar way that um, it's no salvation outside Thomism. And to an Eastern Catholic, Thomism is not the bee's knees as we, as we think it is in Roman Catholicism. To Eastern Catholics, Thomism is not that same thing. Um, so Rassiger adopts this rival school of thought, which is Augustinian. He, he adopts an Augustinian framework. He adopts Bonaventure as his master. He writes on Bonaventure and he starts to interact with the new French scholarship, which puts him in conflict with Michael Schmas, who's representing the old school, the, the neo-scholasticism. Yeah. And what's great about Ratzinger is he helps to bring forward this, for, this fourth Greco-Roman renewal because he helps to balance this greek instinct for new things which are just new things to to safeguard the the same thing and he um he does it in a way that is open to the dialogos with the old and this is something that there's this great quote that he comments on vatican ii because at vatican ii there was a lot of animosity among different bishops or or periti because of the situation of this no salvation outside thomism there were others who wanted to just conform with the modern world and they were they would become the progressive liberal heretics later etc cetera, etc cetera. um but then there were people like ratziger who were really concerned with this really this dialogos this this synthesis between old and new it's something that you know he hammers home as pope is continuity continuity has to always be there and something that he says about vatican ii is that he he critiqued the the schemata that that had been produced at Vatican II, which were produced by the old school neo scholastics, curia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he says, "Hey, they do have a very solid foundation." And, and he says that you know they're, they've got a lot of great things going for them, but I would like to see X, Y, Z, all this great stuff and stuff that he had done in his dissertation, which we can talk about. Um, but he, he was not saying, let's let's have a big rupture revolution and break with the past. He was saying, let's develop it. Let's take on these new things. And he actually was against uh, in, in this this quotation from his memoirs. He says that I was not uh, this is from Milestones. He says I was not in favor of just trashing the schemata as people later did. Uh, he he wanted to develop that. And 
Uh, I wonder if if there had been more moderation like Ratzinger to really bring more new things. And this is what the Comunio School it, tries to do when it breaks from the concilium and, and the progressives is that it's trying to reestablish that continuity because it realizes like like um, Ratzinger says in it in um, uh, uh, in Peter Zewald's volume two of his biography, he says, I was naive about Hans Kuhn. I was naive. Uh, and I uh, didn't realize exactly what he was after until we were a certain point. And then I realized that he was off the rails, you know? Um, so what's so great about Rassiger is that he, he helps to balance this, this situation and brings the church forward in this dialogos between old and new. And, Essentially, my argument in the book is that this synthesis, the dialogos, is still coming about. And it's a painful pruning. And this is something where Ratzker really, really shines, I think, is his theology of history and his, his how he, he's, he sees in 1958, he says, you know, all these people are, all these Catholics are just neo-pagans. Like, we're all just pagans. We're going to church on Sunday, but we're just pagans. And he says that in 1958. And so it's to me, it's no wonder what he says later in 1969 when he has that famous speech where he says the church will become smaller and he's not disturbed. His faith is not disturbed. You know, many of us as Catholics, we are disturbed by what's happening in the church and society. We're disturbed by the fact that there's fewer Catholics, all these different things. But I, I think that we, if we learn from Ratzinger, he shows us that God is really cleansing the church. He's uh in a way we could we could consider it to be the wrath of god he's pouring out the wrath of god in world war one and two um he's sort of letting us going according to our own way you know um vatican ii was this call for renewal this call for um universal call for holiness um the eastern catholic perspective sees vatican ii as a great good for the church because it, it really tries to rebalance uh resourcing the greek fathers and rassiger is a, a critical part of all this um, but Ratzinger notes that the, in 1969, the crisis is going to get a lot worse, um, because there is this cultural Catholicism, which is being unmasked for what it really is, which is just empty and dead. People are just going through the motions, but they're really pagans. Um, and I, I really see the, the parallel that I see here is that, uh, Ratzinger is like Jeremiah writing to the Babylonian exiles who are going out into exile. God is diminishing them. He's, he's sending them into exile. It's, it's the period of wrath. But it's like Jeremiah says, I know the plans I have for you. There is a plan. And Ratzinger, I think, shows this, this insight of history. Um, and he believes, and, you know, and, and we've talked about this, like he, he, sees some, he sees naivete in Vatican II in certain aspects of it. Uh, certain aspects of what Vatican II was trying to do, or so what certain churchmen were doing, there is certain there is a certain naivete in certain areas, but he nevertheless defends always the council that this is the right direction. And I think um, Ratzinger, Ratzinger and and Wojtyla and Jabal too, um, they have brought the church forward through this fourth Greco Roman renewal to try to utilize what is new for the same faith. But what I argue is that this pruning, this synthesis is still going on. And it's, it's very painful because we're in a situation where it's, a, a, you know, desperate time, of course. Um, but God is bringing us through it because he is bringing about this dialogos between the old and the new, between Vatican I and the Roman emphasis and Vatican II, which is more of a Greek new emphasis of new things. Um, and I think I believe that. Um, there is what God's doing is that he's bringing us through this synthesis that is ultimately a response to modernity. And we know that the, the, the first Greco-Roman renewal I mentioned, the segment ecumenical councils, I mean, that went from 325 to 787. So, you know, it's a period of over 400 years with lots of bloodshed, by the way, armies, people killing each other. And, you know, we've, we've spent the past 200 years or so, you know, responding to modernity and now we're seeing a phase of modernity that's even more horrible than the next, you know? So um, I, but I, I just, I think Ratzinger in so many different ways, there's so many different things we can get into about this, but I think that he brings about 
the continuance of this dialogue between, between old and new. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. And it's that balance, you know, we often talk about the hermeneutic continuity, although technically it's the hermeneutic of reform within continuity. So it's um, properly a hermeneutic reform, which he says involves both continuity and discontinuity, but on different levels. There's a continuity with the, the, the essentials but there could be some discontinuity with other non essentials or in manners of expression, but not touching the substance of the faith, for instance. Um, so it is, it's that balancing act of, you know, of course he was, people could debate this, but he's largely a part of that whole race or small movement, which is aimed at a renewal through a retrieval of the broader tradition both in terms of going further back into the past, as well as more broadly geographically with, like, as you said, the Greek and Syriac fathers in addition to the Latin fathers and a broadening of the scholastic tradition because people, someone recently told me that they didn't realize that the race or small movement also was in favor of retrieving the high scholastics. They thought it was just scripture and the fathers, but, no, they were actually for retrieving the high scholastics as well, including Aquinas, but also people like Bonaventure. So, but that was more I mean, to, it's like going back into your attic and trying to find the, the, the treasures that you had packed away that you forgot you had. Then you go back through it and you see what you might be able to bring out, you know, and actually use again. And that was sort of the the gist of that. So in a lot of ways, it's it's something new for our time, but that's rooted in our past and, and trying to revive it. Absolutely. Um, and, it, and, it's, and it's a very difficult, painful, uh, chaotic process. And uh, this is why I think, like, I'm not saying vatican ii was perfect or vatican one was perfect i'm saying that this is part of god's providential plan all this stuff and god is in control of it i mean part of one of the reasons i wrote this book was because i've spent the last 15 20 years studying and researching and i finally found the true faith the roman catholic faith and this is the fruit of all that research diving into all these historical things and and a big part of it is the Eastern Orthodox claims because I was Eastern Orthodox for a few years. Um, and when you get into these East West debates, these centuries old debates between Greek, Greek claims and Latin claims, and you go over these things that have been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and, and you come from that Eastern perspective, it's easy for me to see the great benefit of Vatican II reopening a, a, a very, uh, which it's really, I would say, especially regarding, I, I, let me put it this way, Vatican II, to, to oversimplify, this is an over oversimplification, but I think to a large degree, there is a, in the application of Vatican II in Western Europe and the Americas, there is a co-option with, with modern liberalism um, but there's a great, on the other hand, in the East, there's a great help to the resourcing of, of Eastern thought via Vatican II, um, which actually restores a, like Trent and after there was sort of this Latinizing mindset to a degree in practice. It wasn't officially official policy, but it was sort of in practice. There was a Latinizing mindset, which was Latinizing, uh, Greek, Greek, customs or Eastern customs, Eastern thought and Latinizing it all to an excessive degree. And Vatican II really restores a more traditional view of the East, which you can see, I think, more in the Council of Lyon and the Council of Florence, where Greek and Latins are kind of like equal partners of one Christendom. And they're trying to hammer it out as they did during the first seven ecumenical councils. That's sort of the the two lungs of Christendom as St. John Paul II called it. Um, and that, I think Vatican II helps that. I think that 
The problem is that because there's this, I think it's probably due to the animosity of, of what was going on before Vatican II, there is sort of this marginalization, just as just as the sort of the neo-Thomists sort of marginalized or sought to marginalize the uh, the ressourcement or, or like Rasker people like that. There is also, in practice at least, there is seems to be a marginalization of, like, you know, Gary Gulagrange is, is sort of marginalized as this dusty old Thomas to, you know, it's too rigid or something like that, you know, whereas um, what I'm what I'm saying is that I think the future of Catholic theology, the future of Christendom is in resourcing once again, uh, what we we've kind of cast aside in, in many ways, uh, a lot of things got cast aside. You know, obviously, I would I would say the Latin Mass is one of the big things, the, the central thing. But uh, people like Gary Lagrange, things like that. Um, there's a there's also a resourcing lately of the old anti-liberal critiques of the um, the pre-Vatican II magisterium critique in liberalism them um things like that at which are really, really good so i think that the future is in, in in Christendom in our modernity. Let's see. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. There we go. That's better. <laughs> it wouldn't be a live oh. show without some technical difficulties. So. Great. Now I'm, now I'm on here twice somehow. <laughs> That's so funny. I don't, I don't know, know how. Or what happened there. <laughs> yeah. You're ganging up on me, Richard. <laughs> yeah, but the old screen is still up there. I have no idea. So I'm on it twice. Oh, that's it. funny. <laughs> it's yeah the fbi is after us apparently yeah, yeah <laughs> oh man yes. yeah i think um i think you're right and it's i'm constantly like reevaluating things and you know i think one thing people forget is that after a lot of ecumenical councils, there's been a lot of upheaval. It's not nothing new. I mean, the way St. Basil the Great talks about growing up in the post-Nicene period, just after the Council of Nicaea and how awful it was, and how you had factions within the church warring with one another, distorting the council by excess or privation, you know, we're seeing the same thing nowadays, and it's taking a long time to settle down. Um, and I do think, I mean, um, I have four degrees in theology from, and I went to three different institutions where I studied theology. And, you know, I, I do think there's been a, a tremendous loss in the, the way that it's, the, the different degree programs are structured, I think. Um, I'm constantly working on my ideal curriculum, <laughs> um, but I, I do think we lost a lot of, of valuable things like, you know, Father Laberdet and Garigou Lagrange and Nicola and, and people like that um, who were just good, faithful people. And this is something that I mean, I'm known for my communal side, my race with that's what I've done most of my work in, particularly on Benedict XVI and his part. Um, 
and yet I think that there is a need to be honest about what we've lost from the past. And, you know, it, it's, it's kind of weird for me. I've been talking with people about this, but it's kind of strange looking at the council growing up decades later, because I would have wished more that the race horse mall crowd had collaborated more with the, the scholastics at the council than with the more progressives. <laughs> so um, if I look at those three camps, you know, I see the scholastics and the, and the resource small folks as being much more in line with each other than the other two, than the, you know, communio side with the, the more progressive concilium types. So it's just, it's kind of awkward for we who are sort of in the community of school, you know, there's sort of a split going on within the community of school right now with, um, about how much to retrieve and add in the scholastics, the neo-scholastics even, as a part of the resource mall movement. Because I don't see Garrigou, Lagrange, and Labordette as the enemies. I might dispute with some of them on certain points, I might defend De Lubach on certain things because I think he's got some really good insights. And I probably would agree that we shouldn't reduce Catholic theology to one school of thought because that's not traditionally Catholic. You know, scholasticism was, a, you know, largely represented by the two great pillars, um, Bonaventure and Aquinas. So the idea of only having one of them um, is not really traditional. Um, but that shouldn't mean throwing out the Thomas. Like I think, especially for philosophy, for me, like I, I just, you need that realist metaphysics and it's the best exposition of that is from the Thomas school. Now, there are some improvements in other studies from the Franciscan side that, that are sort of trying to catch up. Um, but, you know, I don't think we should be so quick throw out those new scholastics because they, I mean, if, if anything, you have to at least say that they have a right to exist because they're completely faithful and orthodox. There's no reason they shouldn't be allowed in the academy or given a voice. And I think you can end up having the same overreaction where you're complaining about, okay, well, the neo-scholastics in the Roman Curry at the time were suppressing us too much. Well, you don't want to go and do the same thing to them. That's not really fair either because they have a right to their voice as well because they're perfectly orthodox. And sadly, it's like as those two schools fight with each other, it's like the liberal heterodox progressives are the ones that are sort of <laughs> not being addressed and, and not being called to task. So, you know, if they're allowed freedom, which is arguable, I don't think they should be, um, a fortiori, the neo scholastic should have a voice and should be right. so. And that that's the the that's the other aspect that I that I argue is a part of these Greco Roman renewals is that there are these there's sort of this Greek party who wants new things, and then there's a there's this um, uh, you know this Roman party that wants to, things to stay the same, and they're able to make progress because they they ultimately unite against the heretics in order to define and dogmatize the faith against heresy and i think uh the the christ the 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 tension and the and the this animosity really starts to heat up at vatican one when when the ultramontanists sort of force their way through the council uh and in fairness, fairness to them like i said there's a war going on but <laughs> Newman, Newman says that they're they're basically this tyrant ma majority. He calls them. He he didn't like the way that they acted at the council. And then after Vatican I, Leo the Thirteenth, and, and Vat uh, Pius X, um, this party who wants things to stay the same is just going too intense, as like like you said. And so it's alienating the the sort of moderate party, who's like the Greek instinct, like Ratzinger, this sort of moderate parts, alienated them. 
as well as the heretics. <laughs> so like, it's 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 too much uh, on the other side. And then the, the reaction at and after Vatican II is uh, this sort of loose European alliance, which happens, as you said, uh, between. And I, I think, in fairness, I don't think a lot of people ultimately like Ratzinger, like he says, he does he didn't exactly know who he was allying with. He knew him. Hans Kuhn was was a little weirdo because he, he he critiques him in 1960 before the council, but he, he wasn't even quite sure exactly where he stood until a little bit later. Uh, but they they're, they end up having the, the the sort of liberal progressive wing ends up having enough in common on a very superficial level, just very superficially. Uh, I mean, basically they're basically fed up with the curia. Like that's like the the, the basic thing that they are united on and in fairness there were certain things to be fed up with the curia about too that was fair it was a fair critique there of the curia but as you said I, in, in the in the post vatican II legacy i think i feel like we're finally coming to the point where there is a cooling of these animosities and there's a resourcing people are publishing you know saint paul center is publishing Ricardo lagrange all of there doing a great job thank you scott Hahn. Um, you know, Matthew Minard, our, our mutual friend, doing a great job resourcing Gary Lagrange. Um, and he's given the respect is due more and more. It's not, uh, he's not this, this old, uh, crusty, rigid guy as he once was uh, falsely accused of being. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I have regular contact with Dr. Minard. And I really learned a lot from him. Um, you know, I talk about, sometimes it's funny because I, I send him some talks on things and um, then I read something he sent me somewhat separate from that. <laughs> and it's like Gary Lou Blue, Gary Lou saying exactly the same thing I was trying to say. <laughs> um, I'm like, oh, so he is on the same page. And like, okay, well, that's good to know. Like. You know, so especially like the the idea of what is theology and um, what's the object of theology, and I had sent Dr. Minard a long thought on that, drawing from Ratzinger, and then I'm reading something else he sent me, and there's quotes from Gary who's saying exactly the same thing. Um, <laughs> I'm like, okay, they're actually in agreement here. Um, so I think there's a lot of I'm I'm hopeful that there will be more of a, a making of common cause between the communio and the um, more 20th century outlook because I think there's a lot of room for mutual enrichment there and complementarity. You know, I, yeah, you know, part of the way I look at it is that there's complementary methods that each are employing that have you know, value. The the resource monk crowd is better at, you know, the positive theology of reading through the, the history of the sources and mining those. But the the neo-scholastic tradition is really good at the logical like argumentation and really getting at the nitty-gritty de details on things. And parsing things out very well. Um, and they also have a mystical side, and that's something that's that's lost. I mean, Garrett Google Lagrange was not, you know, completely devoid of a mystical aspect at all. I mean, he was right, yeah. really big on helping to synthesize the so mystic thought the, you know, the mysticism of the Carmelites, for instance. So um it's easy. It's easy for narratives to put people into these boxes, but there's a lot more commonality than in my point. Um, just really quickly, I want to highlight this. Uh, my good friend Jacob Fowler says Lewis Ayers has remarked that the project of resource mom stalled out and has taken the shape of exploring the theology of the figures initially involved in the project. Can you comment on this? Yes, I can. Um, one, I didn't realize that Lewis Ayers had said that, but I've said the same thing. Um, 
I'm not going to go into all the details, but basically I've been pushing for, so this is one of my hobby horses and I'm accusing myself when I talk about this, but one of the cr criticisms of the racehorse mom movement, the communio school was that the neoscholastics tended towards just focusing on the commentatorial tradition of Thomas rather than going back to Thomas himself. And so they were calling for return to the sources, which is scripture, the fathers and the high scholastics. And yet at the same time, the current people involved in the Communio project, and I don't mean like the journal specifically, just the Communio um, school in general, has been that it largely produces articles and books about the founders of the communion, which means they're creating their own commentatorial tradition instead of doing what the founders called for, which was retrieving the sources themselves. So in some sense, the epigons, including myself, of the communio founders has been to create our own commentatorial tradition. And that's largely what my own work's been on. Most of my, you know, my publications are pretty much all on Ratzinger and his thought. So I've done that, but I've started to realize that, okay, that's not really what they were calling for. There's value to doing that, and I'm not against it. But that's not what they themselves did. And I think to truly honor their legacy, we need to have more of that true resource moment where we go back um, and imitate them in delving the depths of scripture and the tradition um, and the patristics and the high scholastics and doing work in that. So that's that's how I would, basically, I don't know that I played at the Racehorse Monk all out the way that Lewis Ayers apparently did. Um, I don't think it's stalled out. I still think it's bearing fruit, but there there is a danger that it is becoming another common sort of tradition. Um, at the same time, I do think there is some value in the commentatorial tradition. And Dr. Minard's been influential um, to me on this because he's, you know, he's he's of the mind that it, it you shouldn't just go back to Aquinas. You can do that, but there have been developments in the thought advancing the school since then. And of course, you can debate with certain people, and you know, I mean, Gergou Lagrange even criticizes Cajetan from time to time. So it's not like it's just a, a rigid acceptance of all of these people, but a critical engagement. But there's things that, you, there are questions you couldn't get into if you didn't read the commentators because Aquinas didn't address them. And these people are addressing them in light of Aquinas, but also expanding it. And that that's a good thing. And so I think in reality, we need, we do need a more Catholic approach to these things where not everyone has to do everything or the same thing as long as you know of course the faith has to be the same and this is another this is an issue that I think comes up is that some people don't understand the difference between a dispute over the faith and a theological dispute and they're not the same thing I mean Aquinas and Bonaventure butted heads on things, you know, and that was considered perfectly legitimate. I mean, if you want to revive scholasticism, scholasticism thrived on the disputed question. That was a regular practice in the scholastic period where you had people taking different positions on a question and hashing it out and arguing them. And, you know, and but they were all scholastic and they were all orthodox, but they had these different takes on these theological questions. And that was perfectly legitimate and it was allowed as long as you weren't going into heresy. So, you know, um, it can be hard to figure out where those lines are, you know. Um, yeah, it, it makes me think of the the medieval scholastics, in order to get your degree, you had to write a commentary on Peter Lombard's sentences, which was just right. a patristic commentary on the scripture. And so everybody's sort of working with the same text to a degree. And really, the, the, we all have the same text as the Holy Scripture is the same text and the, tr interpreted through the tradition. Um, and apparently, but as you say, you say apparently, um, 
I heard that Aquinas actually had a copy of Bonaventure commentary on the sentence. And he did his own work. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, exa- yeah. Uh, and uh, as you said in the beginning, you mentioned how, you know, people nowadays, unfortunately, Catholics, fellow Catholics, we are, uh, people are looking for that label where, where you have this certain tendency here or there, and then you want to label and dismiss someone. And it's one thing to label somebody like a school of thought, like I'm a communio guy, you're a communio guy, you know, I'm a, I'm a teacher by Hildebrand my guy, that's my guy, you know, Christopher Dawson, whatever. But, um, and then we can, and then we can have a scholastic disputation, like we're trying to do now. We're trying to have a dialogue goes here, you know, and, and back and forth, sharpen each other, pursue the truth together and debate. And we're, I mean, we, we're not having a bitter debate here, but, but, uh, but this is, I think, to me, this is, this is restoring Christendom right here is, is, is this, this true dialogue goes this back and forth between these different thinkers and thoughts um, to penetrate the truth, the splendor of truth. As you said in your, I was just listening to, I think it was lecture, lecture four of Madigan two. You said you had some comments about like, why is dogma not boring? Yeah. <laughs> and you were like, because if you want to fall in love with God and, and, and you are in awe of the splendor of truth. And there's something beautiful, I think, about that, that old scholastic model where there was a bitter dispute among brothers. Like there's sort of this fraternal debate where you can have this uh, very bitter dispute between Bonaventure and Thomas. But I love that what I put in my book was this, it, what, it, what it really is, is a, it's, like a, it's a competition for, for humility. It's a, as, as St. Paul says, outdoing one another and showing honor. And I think Bonaventure and Thomas showed this so well in the, the epic scene where uh, Pope Urban tells Bonaventure and St. Thomas to write the Eucharist hymns for the new Corpus Christi feast that he's promulgating. And um, the story goes that Thomas was, so they both went in front of the Pope and Thomas read his Eucharistic for him first. And Bonaventure, who was his critic, he just ripped up his own one because he said, yours is way better than mine. You know, so he, he, all he wants, all they want, all the saints want is to give greater glory to Almighty God. They don't care who does it. But uh, they think I'm right. But if I, I turn out to be wrong, then thanks be to God, you know, greater glory to God. Yeah. And I think also we, we usually put people in the camps, but one thing people may not realize is, well, obviously Bonaventure and Aquinas disagreed on certain things. There's also a lot more commonality than people realize. They're not completely two different schools of thought. You know, I've I've seen it argued, and I tend to agree with this, that both Bonaventure and Aquinas were really Neoplatonizing Aristotelians. The difference was the degree to which they were going to realize that um, Bonaventure was a little bit more critical of Aristotle in certain points than Aquinas was. So, Bonaventure uses Aristotle too, and um, you know there's just disagreements on specific questions, but they're not completely different. Even Scotus would be closer to a point than he would be to modern philosophy. You know, he's still in that plastic frame. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind. And, and I think there's a lot more room for collaboration between the, the neo-scholastics and the Lewis-Book monsters, because I do think there's a lot of overlap. And honestly, I think some of it is, is the mode of presentation. Um, a lot of it does have to do with the style, and, and partly the method and how you do theology, but also the style. It's just, there's different approaches to it. And I'm personally glad that we have both because I get, I get a lot of joy out of, of reading both of them, the theology. And um, so that's, that's my hope. But it's, we do have to overcome this immediate white hat, black hat mentality that all of these people are bad and all these people are good when... In many ways, at least when we're talking about the neo and the neo, the neo 
they're both good and they both have their limitations. And um, there are certain questions they will dispute on and they should be true. But as long as they're remaining within the bounds of orthodoxy, then, you know, we should be allowed to have those disputes. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, Joseph Barasagur and, and Kuro Bajiwa, they give us a legacy of a, a synthesizing, uh, a person, personality who is synthesizing, is, is in dialogue, true dialogue with other Catholics. Uh, Wojtyla is, is very, he's like Thomist, personalist, uh, phenomenology, um, and Ren Ratziger is this Augustinian with Bonaventure. And then I, I feel like there's this great moment because when he writes the new catechism, Thomas is still the, the common doctor of, of the new catechism. He's like the you know third, third largest source of that document. And so I, I feel like they, you know, Ratzinger is not beyond criticism. Uh, neither is Boitua, you know, all these different figures in these popes of modern period, they have blind spots. Even before Vatican II, there's different popes who have, you know, made prudential mistakes or whatever, arguably, we can debate about that. But um, I think the best popes and the best thinkers are giving us this this legacy of uniting as, uh, as Christendom, as Catholics, for the faith in the modern period, uh, for converting modernity and fighting against the evils of modernity and passing down the faith to our children in a way that's um, ever ancient, ever new. Okay, we got technical difficulties. <laughs> well, All right, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what's going on with the, the audio. Um, apparently the microphone is having problems. Can you all hear me okay now? And if you guys have any questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, And then, okay, so my microphone is clear. Oh, I keep. Oh, hey. yeah, we're having a very live broadcast. There we go. That's. <laughs> no, oh, yeah, I don't know if that is that is that any better. I don't know. But No, uh, it is. It's the static's gone now. Oh, okay, good. Wonderful. All right. Well, we've, uh, we've trampled through an hour and a half of technical difficulties and I hope this wasn't a total yeah. disaster <laughs> technologically. <laughs> yeah. And I'm a Luddite. I, I'm not good with technology in general. So I was able, the fact that I was able even to pull this off was a, a win for me. <laughs> but, well, yeah. it's, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I always enjoy talking with you and uh, yeah, I mean, um, so I mean, I think I, I, I don't know if my final comment came through. I, I was just trying to say that I think that Joseph Ratzker really gives us this example, both in his thinking and in his personal life. That's that's the greatness of any thinker is if they put their money where their mouth is. And I feel like Ratzker really did put his money where his mouth is um, in in his his true resource. He, 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 he does resource them all in his thinking, but also in his uh personal life like even michael schmoss whom he had this bitter disagreement which even even decades later he calls traumatic he says well later we became friends <laughs> you know so yeah. like you know they didn't have a the animosity was not long lasting you know so uh looks like jacob has a spicy question <laughs> oh yeah what, in each of your opinions, is the main thing that trads and communio thinkers disagree on? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I, I feel, I mean, the big thing is the liturgy um, right now. Um, I feel like Bratziger, I, I, I depart as I've probably departed in other ways from my fellow trads in this whole conversation, but I, I, I really do feel like Sumorum Pontificum is the traditional answer to our liturgical woes because I don't, I don't think it's traditional to suppress the Novus Ordo. I think a traditional response here would be to uh, sharp, clean up a few things about the Novus Ordo, like, you know, suppress certain abuses that are still going on, unfortunately, which should just end right away. But as far as some of the things without the Novus Ordo that we would, that we might even agree on are, are somewhat deficient in some ways. Like for example, right now it's the Septuagesima season. You know, that's, that's gone in the Novus Ordo. It's just gone. There's no pre-Lenten season. You know, I would call that as a, a loss. Um, but I don't think that's cause for just suppressing the whole right for people who are attached to it. You know, there's, there's, you know, some parish that's just doing fine with the Novus Ordo. I don't think it's traditional to suppress that. I think it's traditional to allow that just like it's traditional to allow the Latin mass. I think it's tradition. That's a more traditional frame of mind for the, for the Holy See to say, if we have an Orthodox right, which is sufficiently Orthodox and not abusing the Eucharist, we cut those off immediately um just allow it um and so i think uh i guess i don't know if this is getting at jacob's question as much but i i think that um many trads believe that you should suppress the novus ordo altogether i i i don't think that that's the answer i think that's um excessive but uh at the same time i i would completely disagree with suppressing the latin mass obviously uh, that would be rasker's opinion as well um perhaps some would I don't think there's a lot of communio people who would want to suppress the Latin mass though. I don't know. What are your I, thoughts? On that? There are a couple maybe, but I don't think it's in general. I think there's actually a lot of love for the, the Latin mass in the communio circle and for the Eastern rites as well. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a split on some people within the communist school perhaps on, on that. I think most would at least like to see a reform of the reform that helps make the, the Novus Ordo more traditional. Yeah. Um, which I do think was Ratzinger's ultimate goal. Um, but he was in principle, and this is something that does get misrepresented in principle. He was against suppressing a right that had been older than 200 years old. So um, now to where it's, it's hard for me to say where trads and Comunio differ. I think where they differ is, it, well, one, it depends what you mean on trad by trad, because in some ways you can consider me a trad, but other people would say I'm not. Um, you know, I attend the, the TLM whenever I can. I used to go until I moved out of the area. I was going almost pretty much every week. Um, but it, it's hard to tell what people mean by that because I think, and I'm not trying to be mean here, but I think there are a lot of trads that think they're well-educated that aren't. And they're, woefully ignorant on what the council actually taught and they're ignorant about theologians that they disparage. Um, when I, so if you're talking about radical traditionalists where they would disagree is precisely the orthodoxy of the communio school itself. Because a lot of trads think that the Lubach and Ratzinger and von Balthasar are absolutely heretic and modernists. But if you've actually read their works, it's really hard to come to that conclusion. You know, they're, that's not, they lump them in with like Kuhn and Schielebecks and stuff, and they're not, they have nothing in common with those people. So I think that's part of it is that there's a lot of ignorance on the trad side about what these people actually hold. And if you, you read, and Correlative with that, I think, would be the value of the post-conciliar text, not just the council. So the value of the conciliar text themselves, for one, but also the value of post-conciliar magisterial texts. 
I mean, and because they almost refuse to even look at those texts, they're I think they're missing out on a great wealth of of um, teaching. Like especially you look at like Dominus Jesus from the CDF under Ratzinger. That's one of my favorite church documents of all time. It's a brilliant text. Yeah, it's a good one. And you know, just I think so. I think one the status of the Communio school is probably where they disagree the most on. Um, they might, depending on the trad, um, they might disagree on the solution to the to the liturgical woes of the day. Because I think while most Communio theologians that I know are actually in favor of the traditional Latin mass, I don't think most of them think that the solution would be to return to the traditional Latin mass alone. Mm -hmm. Because I think they would see that, no, there, there was reasons for wanting to reform the liturgy. There are things in the liturgy that could have used improvement. And um, while at the same time recognizing that the actual implementation has been largely a disaster. And um, so it's like we can agree on the fact that in most places the, the Novus Ordo was not really done according to the mind of the council. Um, the solution isn't necessarily just going back to the Latin mass. It would be, if you're going to go back to that tradition, I think it should be with some reforms as well. I don't think it should be just going back to it. Something kind of in between the two is sort of what I would think is, would be the best, the best approach. I, I, I think a, a traditional approach is to basically tolerate more orthodox rites. Um, I think that I, I think that the the idea of imposing one Roman rite on every single Latin Catholic that itself is an innovation, and and I don't think that's very sustainable. It's not very it, it's anti subsidiarity. It's it's just sort of I mean it's sort of an emergency stop gap stop gap imp situation, which you can understand in a certain context but um I, there's this there's this brilliant passage in uh orientalium ecclesiarum from vatican ii mm -hmm. very first paragraphs there it talks about how the different rites of the church manifest the diversity of the church in one faith and i think that that that's also goes for the latin rites the plural latin yeah. rites um but i think that maybe one way to boil down jacob's question um because it seems like mainly the trads are emphasizing and relying on what I would call the Pian Magisterium pre-Vatican II, meaning Pius the Seventh, or I'm sorry, Pius the Sixth, and Octorum Fidei when he condemns the Synod of Pistoia in the 1700s, all the way to Pius the Twelfth, and all of those popes and their magisterium and emphasizing what they were doing. And trads are very attached to those things. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing to be attached to what was came before us. And they're very, they're strong on those things. Um, and then whereas the communio are very strong in Vatican II and the post concilium magisterium, which are also good things in other ways, as you said. Um, but I, I think what I would argue here, like I do in my book, is that if we go too far in either direction, there's a loss in our response to modernity because we have to have a certain severity against the errors of modernity as the Pian Magisterium had, but we also need to have some openness to the new things as well to, to, to utilize them for the faith um, against certain things that, you know, are all these different aspects of um, liberalism and modernity. Um, so there needs to be this balance. So I, I, that's why I say that, there needs to be the synthesis, but I, I would, I would kind of demarcate them that way in terms of emphasizing magisterial teaching that came before Vatican II in this period versus right. Vatican II after not that communio disparages what came before either, but there's a certain emphasis, I guess, you know, kind of a, a, a what people mainly talk about or emphasize. Yeah. And Jacob has a follow-up said, I did identify the doctrinal developments of Vatican II as the rub Despite it being difficult to categorize people, I think this is the general issue over which the bylines are drawn. And yeah, I'd agree with that, which is why I said, yeah, yeah first Vatican the, II, the yeah. Vatican II documents themselves, and then secondly, the, the post-conciliar documents. 
and I and I think um, what I've what I've tried to do, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna float this idea at Larry Chap too on when I'm on his channel later, because um, it seems to me that as I said this to you and when we were having a private conversation, um, the trads are reacting to what what I what I this distinction that I'm making between the historical reality of the council or the historical event of the council, like what happened at the council and its implementation. So the whole council experienced as a historical reality versus the theological meaning of the council in and of itself. And I think you did, like I, I was just mentioning this in, when I was talking with the, the meaning of Catholic guild chat, you, in your lecture, you brought out how s the subsisted in controversy of the Lumen Gentium should not really be a controversy as should you be. show. There's no reason. Uh, and this is, this is really the theological meaning of that text in and of itself so in and of itself in this theological meaning it has that meaning which is not is not erroneous in any way it's it's very stronger as you say you do a very well jo good job i think it's lecture four again if people want to check it out <laughs> um but what i'm saying is that in the historical reality you know you've got joe schmo sitting in the pew who's been taught since he had his first communion in 1945 that there's no salvation outside the church and i should i should try to convert all my non-catholic family that's what he says in his in his brain you know which is correct but then some hotshot jesuit comes to town and he says oh vatican ii says subsisted in that's not the way you know we no longer have to say that and he uses that text to promote the heresy so all i'm saying is there is this historical event of vatican ii even though that's not the proper theological meaning there is a truth to the fact that the trads are saying Vatican II messed with that, you know, because just in their his, in the historical uh, experience of that, you know, in fairness to the trads, it's not like I, it's not historic. It's not theologically precise to say that subsisted in is her erroneous. But, uh, you know, it was a, a couple decades before that was clamped down on or, 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 or you know, um, clarified more explicitly. Meanwhile, there was, you know, hotshot Jesuits in name only dominating the seminaries and the universities and the press, all saying that this phrase means this heretical thing. So it's a it's a difficult I mean, it's sort of the historical reality of the council, which causes this situation. But in reality, it's it's not. So, but I think these two realities can coexist. And that's the trauma of any council. Yeah. And, and a matter of fact, I would say that that's the what the trads and the community school have in common, which the trads won't give Communio the the credit for, which is that the Communio school is also against the liberal progressives. Uh, yes. <laughs> like, so stop, it gets, if you want to break down the dialogue, call Communio people liberal progressives and you'll, well, it'll drive you insane. Because yeah, yeah there we go. I mean, they were vociferous, Delubach included, and Ratzinger and others were, very much against the liberal progressives in the post-conciliar period. And they all basically go, no, what do you guys do? That's not what we said <laughs> at the council. But, and I do think that the trads should learn from the history though, because like, if you read what St. The, the, like what I was talking about with St. Basil the Great before, you're going to blame Nicaea for the way that you had the people distorting the council, both in excess and in privation after Nicaea in his own day. And he was born after Nicaea, but when he was living and writing and working decades later, it was still a problem that he was dealing with. But he never blamed Nicaea. He blamed the people distorting Nicaea. And so, but it is true. Now, to bring it back to your theme of the Roman and the Greek mind, you had this sort of, in so Vatican I, you had more of the, the, the Roman mind dominated. Vatican II, you had the Greek mind dominated. Well, then in the post conciliar period, you lost some of the Roman mind, which is in, involved with ju jur juridical aspects and order. And the reality of it is, the church hierarchy did become weak. And so when they were overly excessive in the Curia before the council, they became relatively weak after the council and actually dealing with heretics and um, even lower censures and not really stepping in when 
seminaries and university professors were going off the rails. So they lost that Roman aspect of, no, you do need to keep order. Mm -hmm. And so I think that has been a problem. Definitely. And that's really been, to me, the, the, the strength of the trad movement is in, uh, fighting against liturgical iconoclasm and advocating for the traditional solution, which is the charitable anathema, where we, we, we dogmatize propositions and say, here's the line. We can't go across it. That's the only way forward. Um, I think there was, there was the, um, I mean, we can go on and on about this, but I, I really like the, uh, declaration of the declaration of truths. I think it was, it was, uh, Archbishop Schneider and Cardinal Burke and a few other bishops who just put out 40 propositions and they, they quoted Vatican II and the post conciliar magisterium to support these propositions, which were just basically 40, um, either refuting errors or just basic truths, which I think, um, helps as a, as a rallying part point of the faith between communio and, and, uh, trad schools. Um, and I think that that's the silver lining, if we could call it that, of the situation, various things that we're facing nowadays, um, is that it is pushing, it, it's it's really cooling these old animosities and, and forcing us, uh, whether it's things in the church or things in society, it's forcing good Catholics to work together um, against a common foe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just really quickly... Postmillennial Integralist says, I wish we could all see the TLM as a rallying point. I really think things might just take off if the Communio guys got on board. Just to reiterate what I said, I think amongst the Communio guys, there's a lot of support for the TLM. Um, so I, I, I don't think, now again, a lot of us Communio folks would say, yes, we, the TLM is great, but it also should be reformed. Um, but overall, I think there's actually a lot of communio folks that either go to or love the, the traditional Latin mass. So I don't think that really is a dividing point between traditionalists and the communio school itself. I mean, Ratzinger is like the epitome of the communio school. And he's the one that gives, gave us some more in pontificum because he didn't think it should be abrogated. So I don't think that actually is the dividing point. Um MDDK says, not sure if this is relevant to the discussion. Is there a point where the modern academy is not able to deal with these controversies? The Christian theologians should work independently of U.S. schools. Um, well, most, most Catholic theology is taught at Catholic schools. So I don't know if that is really the problem. I think the problem has been renewing Catholic schools themselves. And I think it's improving. I mean, I've seen movement in a number of different places on this. Um, But, you know, that a lot of the problems after the council were actually done at Catholic institutions and not teaching the council correctly. Um, This is interesting. Maybe the minimum extent of recognizing the difference between pontifical degrees versus a standard PhD from a secular Catholic university. Yeah, I mean, I'm blessed because I got three graduate ecclesiastical pontifical degrees, the STB, STL, and STHD. But that's not that's not the norm. Um, on hypothetically having the ecclesiastical pontifical degree is considered higher, but in practice, it isn't necessarily. Um, There is that distinction there, but it's um, the basic purpose of those degrees is you can't give those degrees as an institution unless you have a certain critical mass of people with pontifical degrees. So to even qualify to to be able to give pontifical degrees, a certain number of your faculty have to have pontifical degrees. So, but the reason that I think that's not as common is because the ecclesiastical degrees take longer time. Because 
there's three ecclesiastical graduate degrees in theology, not two. So instead of MA, PhD, you have to go through STB, STL, and STHD. So it takes a lot longer. You have a lot more coursework to do, um, which I is very beneficial. But when you have more lay theologians nowadays, you know, they've got family. They can't be in school forever. They've got families to raise. And, you know, as you yourself know, I mean, even doing the MA, PhD, trying to finish both of those when you're trying to have a family is not is not an easy task. But yeah, it's a good point. I mean, the, the distinction between those two degrees. Um, there's an interesting, the, the comment about McLuhan, I'm very fascinated. I'd never read McLuhan on Vatican II and I'm just looking it up and it, it's- I haven't um, either. I see there's, looks like a thesis paper I just found about McLuhan on Roman Catholic liturgical change. I, I think it would be a fascinating look because McLuhan is a very insightful thinker um, to consider. Um, but I, and I think that Rassiger was really, would really, I mean, as he says, he says in uh, milestones, the whole foundation of our whole crisis is, is liturgical. That's the, like the, um, the, the fundamental aspect of it. Um, and, uh, there's a, Scott Hahn said a, a beautiful thing when I was interviewing him a couple of months ago, he said like in his book, holy is his name. If we get holiness, right. Then everything sort of flows from that. And, uh, Ratziger points out that the, the liturgical iconoclasm of the day was making it so that people were basically weaponizing the new rite of mass to have P the communities create their own, uh, create themselves and, and sort of was this this worship of man worship of the community uh so it was not this this uh encounter with the holiness of god as the liturgy should be but i i yeah i'd love to hear uh McLuhan. yeah and of course that's a big part of um ratzinger's bonaventurian background as well um because for St. Bonaventure, the model theologian is actually St. Francis of Assisi, even though St. Francis was not educated. Hmm. Because if you're in such mystical union with Christ that you bear his wounds, that is a higher form of knowledge of God than what you're going to study in a university. And the priority of the mystical, of the spiritual, of prayer and moral life is absolutely central to, to Ratzinger. There's actually, um, I'm trying to remember who said it. I don't know if it was in Rausch's book on Benedict or what, but I think it was him, um, where he was visiting Ratzinger when he was still a professor, I believe in Regensburg at the time, which was the last university he taught at. Um, they were meeting at Ratzinger's house and at one point Ratzinger had to excuse himself because he needed to go because he was going to participate in, um, I forget the term, my Andacht or something like that. It's a, it's a, um, I, I don't know if it's the May crowning or something similar. It's a Marian devotion in the month of May that was around at that time. And Rausch thought to himself, Wow, for a professor, he's very pious. Uh, but it, that means he's a true theologian, is what yeah. he is. Uh, and for Ratzinger, it's like, how could you not be? Yeah, that's that's like, what that's uh yeah, that's what's great about Ratzinger. Like what you you put this in your personal reflections on this channel. People can go, I think it was the previous video after this before this one. We just talked about how Ratzinger did theology in a way that spoke to your heart and speaks yes. to people's hearts. And that's what true theology is. It's not academics. It's it's prayer. It's a fruit of prayer. It's a contemplation of the truth. And it's the splendor of truth. And that's what true theology is. Not like these uh, academics nowadays who call themselves theologians. Uh, you know. No, and it's so. something that I am constantly, you know, when I'm doing my own work in theology, I'm constantly thinking about those questions because I have... 
I, I can get very frustrated when there's popular things out there that distort things and, and aren't scholarly grounded because they're in a, because they distort a picture. But then I also get fed up with overly academic things where it's like, is the best essay really one where you draw from 40 different sources in a 20 page paper? Because you're creating, in some sense, you're creating a Frankenstein and it's like, you're, you're multiplying footnotes in order to appear like you've read more than you probably actually have and to mm. seem like you're more scholarly grounded. But how often can you actually follow a train of thought well when you're cut and pasting from 40 different sources? Like that's not an easy thing to do. Mm. And I think sometimes we the best works of theology are the least scholarly or, you know, when they're not hung up on how many sources have I read and what are the dates of the sources so that the newest ones take priority. And mm -hmm. just because something was published in 2022 doesn't make it better than something was published in 1989. Now, sometimes there's advances in certain sciences where that's the case, but not always and not, especially with theology and philosophy, that's not always the case. Yeah. So I think more expositions of, of thought that are that follow a train of thought rather than just focusing so much on footnotes is, is a good thing. But yeah, I mean, for me, the mystical aspect is it's it's crucial, you know, and that's one thing I do love about Ratzinger because he he does that. Yeah. He's definitely a, a prayer. I mean, yeah. We might lament his um, abdication of the office, but it was because he wanted to read and pray and prepare for death. And at least that aspect of his life is like, I need the church more than the church needs me. Mm -hmm. You know, I need to prepare for death. Now, he also thought he was going to die in a year. He didn't think, he really didn't think he was going to live as long as he did. Um, but, you know, I think that humility he had and because he always one thing in his, his writings that i loved and this comes through in milestones especially in his youth was for him the priority of the faith of the simple and you know you get these academic theologians that get upset if the magisterium steps in and tries to you know call boff or gutierrez or kung to task yeah or roger hate how dare you do this? You know, you're hindering academic freedom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're, so they're, they portray the magisterium as this totalitarian dictator that's squelching their freedom. And Ratzinger's like, no, it's the magisterium's role is to protect the faith of the simple from, right. the, from the dictatorship of the academic elite. I, I can't remember where he wrote that, but I remember reading it when I read that from it. I was like, oh, that's such a great way to say it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I love that, that, that phrase of his, um, yeah, that's, that's really that. And, that, and, and he, you know, he did that, of course, um, you know, trads, I, I have a video, I have a whole video on trad, a trad perspective on Vatican, on Vatican Benedict the 16th. And as I said, every Pope of the modern period, you know, could have done more X, Y, Z, you know, but we should just be grateful for all these great things. I mean, there's so many, so much greatness, so many good things. Um, so I think that, that right there is, is the core of it. The heart of it is that prayer that simple. Yeah. Faith like a child. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah man. Faith is simple. And for him, that is the priority and that's why the church exists. And, you know, to keep the people from being misled by these, academics with their newfangled theories that will be gone tomorrow yep. and confusing people is like, no, like if you go out of bounds, you're going to be called, you should be called out. Now, how much we've done that is another question, but right. um, that was his mentality at least. And, and he saw, I think he saw that because he, I mean, example he would give is during world war two, who's buying into Nazism. It's the doctors, the politicians, the lawyers, all of the high educated people, the professors, 
and he says the humble Bavarian farmers wanted nothing to do with it. Right. And it was their Catholic piety that helped them resist that ideology. So often, you know, as he says in milestones, you know, quoting scripture that you've re- hidden yourselves from the wise and the learned and, re- and revealed yourself to these little ones. And that's, I think, the source of his humility, because even though he's a tremendous intellect, he carried that piety and that humility in his person as the foundation of his his own work. And I think that's what enabled him to be so brilliant. My, my favorite my favorite part about reading his two volume biography is his childhood, his family life. It's it's like it's so touching and, and beautiful. And there's this moment where uh, during World War Two, Joseph, the young Joseph Ratzger finally gets back home. But then Georg is gone. Yes. He's in the he's in the PO. I don't even know if he was detained in a POW was- camp or not, but. They didn't know finally, where he was. Yeah. It but there's been... this moment when they all like Georg finally, like he like shows up on the door. They don't even yeah. know that he, if he's dead or alive. He shows up at the door. Like for viewers, you know, um, Joseph Ratzinger had an older brother, Georg, and a, I think a younger sister. Um, I don't um, remember. Her name. I think both but, were older. Oh, okay. Well, Georg shows up at the door and then he just goes straight to the piano and starts singing. Uh, or what is it? Praise we all our God. It's like the God beyond all praising. I oh God! Or so, he, they just start singing a hymn of praise that that he's back yeah. alive. It's just this this beautiful moment. That yeah, I, I cheered up when I read that. Yeah. Oh, I mean, too. Yeah. Me too. I was. Oh, it's just like so good. It's just so. Yeah, I, I, like I, I, been, yeah. Two or three months they hadn't heard from him. Man, and they had no idea if he was alive or dead or wounded or where he was, and yeah. he just shows up and goes to the piano immediately. <laughs> Holy God, we praise thy name. Oh, yeah, I think that was it. Yeah, Yeah. but it's just... uh, In German, but yeah. Yeah, but just this, the family life that he had is the piety of his father um, and just growing up with this and the the strong Bavarian Catholic culture. And I feel like it really served him so well in in his life. So anyhow. (laughs) Uh, In the beauty of creation. mm. That was... um, he would visit Mary in shrines and cathedrals, but also spend time in in meadows and in the woods. And um, sometimes, like there was a monastery that they would a shrine that they would go visit that was on top of a mountain, and, and it was in the woods. And he describes the scene, and it's like something from a fairy tale, the way that it's you know portrayed. And um, it's funny because I thought I was being original. I came up with a theory for why atheism tends to be stronger in cities and theism tends to be stronger in rural areas. And um, when I was working on my dissertation, I came across um, a work he did while he was at Vatican II, actually, something he wrote where he makes the exact same point I was making. Ah, I was like, Oh, well, right. He came up with this like 50 years ago. All right. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Well, mm-hmm. I'm, uh, that's it. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Thanks and for having me, man. It's always good to talk with you. Yeah. God cool. So, it. yeah, my book, City of God versus City of Man. Yeah, and there's a out. link for it in the description. Uh, there's a link to the, the Amazon link is in the description of the video yes. so check Fantastic. it out all right well thanks for having me on richard yeah good to have you on and uh have a good rest of your evening you as well god bless god bless